This handsome young man you see in the picture before you is author Jack Kerouac. He's not spoken of much these days, but almost everyone has read works or heard music influenced by him. Jack Kerouac was born a century ago in New England, the son of devout French Catholic parents. He was bright as well as handsome and accomplished athlete. He went to Columbia on a football scholarship, but after breaking his leg early in his career, he dropped out of college altogether. He joined the Navy during World War II, but was discharged early for what we would call post-traumatic syndrome disorder today after narrowly escaping uh, and surviving a Nazi submarine attack against his ship in deep waters. His traumas, his introverted personality, his addictions, his natural restlessness put him on the road for the rest of his life. New York to Los Angeles, Los Angeles to Mexico City, Mexico City to Detroit and Chicago in what are now vintage automobiles, giant banging gasoline guzzlers, staying in hotels on the rare occasions that he could afford them, but mostly sleeping under the stars or crashing with old and new friends. All along the way, he wrote poems, he wrote stories about his life on the road while listening to western swing music, early rock and roll, and jazz. His favorite artists were Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk. These people became his friends, and along the way, other writers became his friends, Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, and the like. Kerouac called his circle of friends the Beat. Because they were, quote, beat down, beat up, and beat out. And also because they possessed beatitude. He concluded that they were blessed and could be a blessing to others. It was a small group, but they set off a much larger movement. Kerouac and his friends became known as beatniks. A derogatory term at first. But instead of resisting it, they embraced it. They were goth before goth was cool. With their dark clothes, girls with straight, unfussy hair, boys with goatees if they could grow them, round glasses, circular little shades, berets on their heads, reading poetry and listening to bebop and coffee shop. They used words and phrases like groovy, far out man, Shooting the breeze, hey cat do you dig, square, cool, a whole set of idioms that are still in use today. Kerouac said that it is a generation of illuminated hipsters suddenly rising and roaming through America. Serious, bumming and hitchhiking everywhere, ragged, beautiful, in an ugly, graceful way. We are beat, beat down beat out, but full of intense conviction. And I am beat. That is, I believe in the beatitude that God so loved this world that He gave His only begotten Son to it. And who knows? The universe just might be one vast sea of compassion beneath all this show of personality and cruelty. A few years later, as the 1950s lurched toward the countercultural 1960s, Kerouac was asked by a reporter, are you a hippie? And he answered, hell no, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> he thought the hippies were spiteful and shallow, but he could not ignore the influence that he had on the generation that followed him. Here's a slide of some artists you may know who were devout followers of Kerouac and put his words into their music, into their works. Jim Morrison, Bob Dylan, Janis Joplin, John Lennon, Mick Jagger, Jerry Garcia, Natalie Merchant, Patti Smith, Bruce Springsteen. They all incorporated Kerouac into their thoughts. And what were those thoughts about? Well, a lot more than just sex, drugs, and rock and roll, psychedelics, and, and exploration. It was about a nonconformity. It was about authenticity. It was about this quest, 
the search for meaning, the journey of life, finding individuality, finding liberation, finding inner freedom. Characteristics our world could certainly stand today. Jack Kerouac's masterpiece is a book called On the Road, as you might expect. It's his own story of those cross, cross-continent jaunts, hitchhiking and zooming over the deserts and the plains of North America, crossing the Rockies, traveling sea to shining sea. And I've read the book a couple times, and I returned to it recently to check my margin notes and highlights, what with this current series about taking to the road. And here is a paragraph that I had highlighted, and it really struck me. The only people for me are the mad ones. And he means zeal here, almost insanity, not anger. The ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. The ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but they burn, burn, burn like fabulous yellow Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. And in the middle you see the blue center light pop And everybody goes, oh, isn't that great? And in one sentence, a little bit later, he admits that his zealous search along the road might be too much. He says this, I like too many things and get all confused and hung up running from one falling star to another. I have nothing to offer anybody except my own confusion. And that's where we are and where we have arrived on the Emmaus Road. Jesus has met these two downcast disciples. And now, as he explains the scriptures to them about himself, whom they have not yet recognized, Jesus is burning, burning, burning the brains and the hearts of these two disciples like a fabulous yellow Roman candle. And as they walk along dumbstruck by his explanation of all that has happened, all they are offering back in return is confusion. But they latch on to Jesus like drowning men. For obviously, whoever this is they are walking with is mad to live, mad to talk, mad to save, never uttering a commonplace word and they want it all. And they beg him to stay with them. As he seems ready and bound to disappear over the horizon and on to another adventure. Verses 28 and 29 again. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. And so he went home with them. I love Luke's turn of phrase. This was the end of their journey. So they thought. But their journey was just beginning. It was about to take on an entirely new dimension. They could not realize how their lives would change. How their lives were changing even as they were walking. Jesus, yes, was going further on, a little further on down the road. But he stopped with them long enough to ensure that he had lured them out to travel further themselves. Nothing was yet over. Nothing had ended. It was all just getting started. Dazzling light would explode from within their darkness Life would be resurrected from what they thought was dead. And faith would burn, burn, burn again. Even after all they had to offer was confusion. And it's that confusion I want to talk to you about today for just a few minutes. And I would like, if we could, to get the defrost pushed back to at least maybe 70 degrees instead of the 43 degrees that it is on the stage right now. I'm sorry, our air conditions have been offline, and we've had them fixed, and we just love them now. And they, but it is pumping out today. So, In July, I won't be saying that, I know. But 
So it's this confusion I want to talk to us, talk to you about today. Confusion along the road and reconnect it to where I left you last week. I talked about last week how we are sometimes forced to change our minds about things and forced is the correct word. We usually don't change our minds, our view of the world, our perspective on faith or God or reality or what we believe. We usually change none of these until we have to. And when we are forced by circumstances, forced by disillusionment, by crisis, by the erosion of our foundations to reassess our journey, there is a lot of confusion. There is a lot of chaos. And there are often many more questions than there are answers. And I said to you last week that that's when you just might find the living Christ walking beside you. You may not notice Him at first. You may not recognize Him. Christ may come to you in ways that you never dreamed of, in a form you could have never expected, but Christ will come to you in the chaos And in the confusion, He will find you on the road. And it won't be simply for the purpose of changing your mind or changing your attitude about something. It will be for the purpose of changing you as a person. But before you change, you will be confused. It's natural. It's to be expected. It is the way it is. Once you are on the road, you will encounter roadblocks. Intense seasons of questioning, dark nights of the soul, arrows shot toward heaven that never seem to find a target. Janet Hagberg rightfully calls this the wall. You crash up against it and things go to pieces. And speaking of pieces, I've told you in the past that when working with groups on issues of stuck faith or faith in crisis, I sometimes give those groups puzzles to work out. If you were at one of these little retreats, it would look something like this. Let's say there's a group of 12, 15 people. Well, I would divide them up into four different groups. And I would all give them all a box, a puzzle to solve and it'd be a children's puzzle typically 50 75 pieces not real hard all of them factory sealed and I hand them out and they go to work putting their puzzles together and invariably without fail even though I don't say anything like this they think it's a race everybody oh it starts busy well I'm evil in a way And one of the boxes looks factory sealed, but it's not. And I've taken all the pieces out of that box. And I've replaced them with a different puzzle. And the box says horse. The puzzle says butterfly. And it takes about 90 seconds for the people in that particular group to figure out that something is wrong. And then invariably, without fail, Hey, this isn't fair. Wait a minute. But then, invariably, somebody in that group will stick with it. Now, I've seen people in groups check out. Well, I ain't doing this. You know that person? This isn't fair. This isn't fun. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. And I usually would just want to stop and say to that person, well, this is life, so suck it up, right? Because life isn't always fun. Life is not fair. And I guarantee you that whatever image you have in your mind of the puzzle you set out to solve with your life, it might say horse, but I bet you're dealing with butterflies. Because the pieces that we have been given are not always what is on the box. And if somebody is telling you that, that you can believe your way or will your way into making the life you're putting together look like some kind of boxed up picture, 
If someone is telling you that, they're probably trying to sell you something or they're an Instagram evangelist and you should stop listening to that person. Because the reality is, you've got to find the edges and put the pieces together based on the pieces that you have been given. That's life and that's faith. And when we hit this wall, when we hit this roadblock, what is actually happening sometimes is we are coming to the conclusion, the reality, and it's a blessed reality eventually, that this is not exactly what I thought it would be. Now, go back to Janet Hagberg. She wrote a book decades ago with the now late Robert Gulick, if we could put up the slide. It's called The Critical Journey. And their work is built on older research by Dr. James Fowler, uh, whose leading book is entitled Stages of Faith. And it all sounds rather technical and boring. I assure you it is not. I picked up the cricket, critical journey, I think 1998, 1999, something like that. I picked it up at one of the most critical stages of my life. When I had, in fact, slammed against the wall but I didn't know the name for it. I didn't really have words for the experience that I was going through. And I can tell you that Janet Hagberg's words, and I wrote to tell her this at the time, and she and I have corresponded over the years since. She is a gift to the world. One of the most helpful and healing people that I have ever encountered. And I told her that page for page and word for word, no book I have ever read has been more healing and helpful to me than this title right here. It caught me at the right time at the right place. You may buy it and pick it up, and I'm not getting any commission uh, for, for pitching her book now. You may pick it up and read it and think, that did nothing for me. Well, for me, it was right on time, and it was very good medicine. Now, here is a summary of that book. We all move along the road of faith. It begins with curiosity we move toward conversion. We begin to live a productive, growing spiritual life. We become faithful and committed. And the majority of churches, the majority of Christian living books and songs and paraphernalia are designed to take you this far. But there's not much out there that will take you into the next step. Because we sort of design our churches to get people in on the Jesus thing. You know, Follow Jesus, it looks like this, become a, a, a disciple, and now here is your job assignment as a believer, done and done. No. At some point in your journey, if you live long enough, you're going to hit the wall. And it's going to feel a lot like a bug hitting your windshield. It's going to hurt. How do I describe it? It feels, it felt like me, like I was losing my faith. Maybe. Losing my mind. It feels like everything you were ever told about God or believed about God is wrong. It feels like faith simply doesn't work anymore. All the prayers you used to go to, all the Bible verses you have memorized, all the routines that used to do the trick seem to lose their power. It feels like all you can do is ask questions and make accusations, but there are no answers or responses forthcoming to satisfy you. It feels like nothing is certain anymore, that you can't get anywhere, that maybe everything you have believed in has been a farce your entire life. And your unassailable, bulletproof solutions fail and no amount of praying harder or believing more or reading your Bible or rededicating your life will remedy that for you. Now, from the critical journey, Hagberg says this. When we enter this uncharted territory, neither our faith nor our God provides what we need to soothe us, heal us, answer our prayers, fulfill our wishes, change our circumstances, or solve our problems. Our formula of faith, whatever that may have been, simply does not work anymore. I like William Butler Yeats, the poet here. Things fall apart. The sinner cannot hold. Anarchy 
is loosed upon the world. That's what a crisis of faith feels like. And it's not a contemporary thing. Crisis of faith is as old as faith itself. God called Abraham out of his home in Mesopotamia and said, I want you to go to a place that I'm going to show you and live a way that I'm going to tell you. And I'm not going to explain it all. You're just going to have to leap. And Abraham makes the leap of faith and then loses that faith and makes a disaster of his world before coming back to that faith. Moses thinks that he can rescue God's people his own way and thinks God is behind it. And Moses ends up out in the desert for 40 years tending sheep before God comes back around finally and says, I know you thought it looked like that, but it looks like this. Samuel is told, I need you to go anoint a king of Israel for me. And Samuel heads, heads out to the Judean countryside looking for Adonis or Hercules. What he gets is a scrawny little shepherd boy who writes far too much poetry and spends too much time playing the harp. And God says to him, man looks on the outside. God looks at the heart. The prophets believed that their temple was indestructible. That God inhabited that temple. That they were a light to the generations and nothing would ever extinguish that light until it was extinguished. And their faith collapsed. Their entire society collapsed. They go into exile for 70 years. And they have to start over with what faith means. We move to the New Testament. Simon Peter is having a siesta on a rooftop in the village of Joppa on the Mediterranean Sea one day. God comes to him in a vision. And God essentially says to Peter, if you can wrap your mind about around this, do you dig? Okay, if you can wrap your mind around this, God comes to Simon Peter and says, God says, I need you to change your mind about what God said. And now you've got to do it this way. And Simon Peter is shattered by the experience. And we always like to throw the Apostle Paul up as this wonderful example on the Damascus Road. Hallelujah, he meets Jesus on the Damascus Road and all is well. Have you read that story? All is well? It so shattered the man. When God appears to him quite literally on the road as if he was walking the Emmaus Road, another Luke account. But more forcefully, Paul is so shattered by the experience, he retreats into the desert for three years of his life and spends a decade back home putting the pieces of his faith and life back together. You don't see it in the timeline, but from that Damascus Road experience to the first time he sets foot on a missionary journey is 14 years. What was he doing? Trying to sort it all out. Because when you put your confidence in a particular interpretation, a particular view of the world, and you have built your life on that, and it all comes falling down, that doesn't get rebuilt overnight. So, the bad news. You're going to have long stages of your life where you are confused. The good news, if you're confused, I am so happy for you because the next step is a breakthrough. The next step is looking around at all the shattered pieces and saying, instead of giving up, maybe I can start to put this puzzle together. It's not the puzzle I thought I had in my hand. It's not the image that I anticipated. I'm not where I thought my life would be. My faith doesn't function like I thought it would. Or even like it used to. But I am going to play the cards that I have been dealt. I am going to take the pieces. And try to find some edges. And start to put this back together again. 
And next week we'll talk about what that looks like.